So listen, Michael, uh, the last time we spoke was in May. And at the time, there was a sense of excitement from you about that Conor McGregor fight. It was finally booked and set. Obviously, did not come to pass. We, we know what happened. You do seem like kind of a glass half full kind of guy. So I, I really want to ask you, at what point did it really start to feel like the wind was changing with regard to that fight on June 29th? Uh, there's only one way to be, and that's glass half full. Uh, we, uh, I have so many things to be thankful for in my life, and I'm human just like you. I am prone to wander. Uh, I feel sorry for myself. I find negative things where they aren't really that negative. We're looking for bad things. We have we have that tendency as human beings, but overall, I am so truly blessed. So I looked at the Connor situation um, like it was something that we we chased and we followed the path for a while. I had a lot of and I, we talked about this in the last interview. I had a lot of securities um, and and conversations going on behind the scenes that the media, the, the fans, the people didn't really know. So I knew the fight was eventually going to get booked. It did get booked. Last time we talked, I was training for it, excited for it. The rug, get, rug gets pulled out from under me a couple weeks before, but I've been here before. I've been here numerous times. Guys have pulled out of fights. These fights are never guaranteed until you're actually inside the octagon. That cage door closes and Bruce Buffer is announcing your guys' name and then the bell rings. Um, so it's uh, I, I felt sorry for myself for a couple of days, you know, packed everything up here in Florida, drained my cold plunge, unplugged everything, locked my door, flew home, licked my wounds for a couple of days and then uh, got back on the horse and continued to train because I knew either the fight with Connor was going to be rebooked pretty quick or it wasn't and I was going to go fight someone else and now here we are this opportunity huge opportunity against Charles Oliveira number one contender fight co-main event five rounds on the John Jones versus Stipe at Madison Square Garden the world's most iconic arena it's not the Connor fight but if you could think of a next best thing this is definitely it and now we're wor working toward the title and I definitely want to talk to you about all that, but I do just have a couple things I wanted to talk to you about just with with regard to this whole kind of thing. Because one thing you had shared with me that really I thought was very interesting was the fact that you'd shared that you did a lot of journaling about kind of oh, that gosh. process of waiting. Yeah, I would love to know, like, what were you writing about? Uh, honestly, the funny thing is I just got done with a journal entry and it's a 180 page journal. It's a big, thick moleskin one. And when I bought it, I was like, dang, dude, this is, it's like when you buy a book that's 400 pages compared to hundred pages, you're like, man, am I really gonna finish this thing? Um, and I'm about three quarters of the way through it. I've been journaling four or five times a day, every single day. And I think that has become such a huge cornerstone. You know, I've talked about journaling. I've journaled a lot, a decent amount in the past, but not to this extent. And I think, it's so much more about me telling myself and being unashamed of who I am, taking the weights off, taking the shackles off, taking, taking the blinders off of who I am, what I've accomplished, what my skills are, who I am and who I am not, and what God's promises are for my life, because I truly have been living subpar as an athlete. Uh, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, I believe I believe I can do so much more with these gifts that I've been given. And that's what that journal is. It's it's my mind. It is my thoughts. It is my affirmations. It is who I am and who I am not. And as soon as I get done with it, my, my son happens old enough to read, but not, not old enough to read my chicken scratch. But someday I'll have it and it'll be given to him and he can read through this entire process where my mindset was when daddy came home on the weekends to be dad, even though I'm not hundred percent dad, I'm not in the hundred percent dad mindset. Cause I'm fully focused on this fight. He'll know what I'm going through. He'll know the struggles. He'll know what I did this morning, what I did great, what I didn't do great, what I think about myself and finally taking the blinders off. But, you know, I really needed to start it during the process of the Connor fight, because as you know, you've covered mixed martial arts, the Connor fights, a big fight. And whether I have the skills or not to win, it doesn't matter if I don't truly believe that I deserve to win at that magnitude, at that platform. So that's what it's been. And uh, I need to order another one because I'm almost three quarters of the way through this one. Sure, sure. Now, again, you're, you're a glass of full guy. So I know that there are positives you take away from this whole ordeal as well. It wasn't an, an entire negative uh, in your mind. But I'm curious, what was the biggest thing that you took away from the whole Connor experience on a personal level, what was that big takeaway for you? If there was one, no, there was, there was so many. And when you're in it and this is how you never, you never know how your story is being written in the moment, right? I don't know how my story is going to be seen 20 years from now in today, because I'm just living in today. Right. But what that 
what that experience did for me, number one, having that much time off, I needed it. I really needed it. Six training camps in a 26 month period. Every single, every single fight was do or die. Top three, top five guy, world title fights, fights of the night, fights of the year. And I love the sport. I am so blessed to do the sport of mixed martial arts as a professional and get paid for it and feed my family with it. But it was taking a toll on me. I needed some time off. And I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in college, my coach, my coach's name was Brian Smith, and he was the greatest coach that I've ever had and will ever had or have. But I put so much pressure on myself, worked so hard, did too much sometimes, and focused so much on being great that he had to pull me out of the wrestling room. And he would say, Michael, I'm pulling you out of practice. You're not allowed to come to this Hearn Center where we train and lift and do all our stuff for 72 hours. I don't want it's Monday right now. I don't want to see you here till Thursday. And I'm like, wait a second, coach. So all the guys are going to be training and I can't train. He's like, no. I was like, well, can I go for a run, do a lift? Can I go do this? He's like, no, I don't want you to do anything. And then I would come back and I would be rejuvenated. So it's really funny how 15, 16 years later, the sport Brian Smith me and pulled me out of it to then fill up my cup to become a better man, a better fighter, a better athlete, a more seasoned veteran, and a more confident individual, plus the actual physical, biological rest that I gave my, my, my body. So I just feel rejuvenated, man. I love this sport so much more right now than I ever have in my entire life. And that's a dangerous guy. A happy fighter is a dangerous fighter. And I am so happy and so grateful. And obviously you do take a, all of that into this fight here. Madison Square Garden, like you mentioned, Charles Oliveira, second time you guys are meeting. This is your fourth time at Madison Square Garden. You have not quite climbed the the. It's okay. You can say I'm 0-3 at, at Madison Square Garden. That's okay. Let's just get that out of the way right there. Don't be afraid <laughs> to beat around the bush. I have never won inside of Madison Square Garden. So I, 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 I'm I deciding to change that this time. <laughs> so, but how do you, like, do you like that challenge? Is that really something that, like, obviously that's not why you take the fight here, but when it comes to you and they say, okay, it is Madison Square Garden, the thought has to go through your head and you, and you, you seem to like to meet these challenges, right? Yeah, I love the challenges. And, and let's start off by saying it's a huge blessing to be considered for the Madison Square Garden card. They don't just throw anybody on the Madison Square Garden card. They are guys. The UFC puts guys and gals on the on the on the fight card that are going to put on a great show. And I, I saw John Jones at UFC 306 at the Spear. We said hi, took a picture together, you know, the main and co-main. And he's like, hey, man. Make sure you save some excitement for me because I'm the main event. And I'm like, yeah, probably not, man. I'm coming to steal the show. Um, but yeah, I definitely thought about that. And I just, it couldn't have been scripted any better to fight a guy, to the, to beat a guy who has now beaten me for the world title. I had one goal when I got into this sport, to be the number one guy in the world, to be widely regarded unanimously as the number one guy in the world. Charles Oliveira stole that from me, beat me fair and square. But he stole that dream from me. And now I get the opportunity to right that wrong in my mind, show up a better fighter, get my hand raised. And then when I beat Charles Oliveira, I am the highest ranked guy in the lightweight division, not named Armin Sarukian or Islam Mahachev, who are fighting in most likely January, it sounds like people are talking about. So I'll be cage side watching that fight to watch who my next fight is, who I'm going to fight for the title. So you couldn't have scripted it any better. And it's at Madison Square Garden, where I have currently been defeated. Um Every fight's been great. Uh, fight of the night every every time. Fight of the year, twenty twenty one with Justin Gaethje. Fight of the fight of the year um, candidate with Dustin Poirier. So it couldn't be scripted any better. The stage is set, and it's the world's most iconic arena. I'm gonna go there and steal the show. And so obviously, yeah, tons of demons you can exercise in this one. Um, that first fight, though, Charles Oliver, twenty twenty one. That was in Houston. That was not at the Garden. But you put him through the ringer. In that first round, he had you in some spots too. I mean, that was a wild fight too. You're only in those wild fights, of course. But other than the obvious, I'm curious, what went right and wrong that night for you? Um, I'll tell you exactly what went wrong. I signed with the organization in September of 2020. Um, and then I was fighting for the world title in May of 2021. I only had one fight inside the UFC octagon and it was against Dan Hooker. Number five guy in the world, I knocked him out within two, two and a half minutes. So I had two or two and a half minutes of experience inside of the UFC octagon. A week after that fight, Hunter Campbell calls me and said, Khabib is retiring. He's really not coming back. Poirier and Connor are fighting each other. Uh, so now it's you versus Charles to fight for the title. So I had almost no time to really process and build and grow. I'm 38 years old and I was 34 back then, but I'm still growing. We're all still growing as human beings. Um and I just wasn't, I, I wasn't where I needed to be. I went in there, 
very confident. I put in a great training camp, but I went out there to try to kill Charles Oliveira in the first second of the first round. Um, 10 aided him in the first round, and I just wasn't able to keep that pace. I made a bad decision, um, put myself in some bad spots. I wasn't fighting to the best of my ability, and I've since fixed all of those things, mainly mentally and spiritually. And uh, I just think it's going to be – it's going to be a masterful performance, and I think I'm going to surgically and systematically break this man down until he looks for the exit sign, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to finish, and I'm going to get my hand raised. And um, what did go right is he felt my power. He felt my tenacity. He felt my speed. He felt my strength. He felt my size. He felt my presence um, for as long as that fight lasted. He remembers that. He's. I'm not saying he's scared of me. I'm not saying he's apprehensive or, or fearful of me, um, but he knows what he is up against. And this version of me, Chandler 2.0, is much different than Chandler 1.0 that he fought at UFC 262 in Houston. And I'm excited to go out there and not just show him that, but to show my, the entire world that. Five round non title fight. You are no stranger to five round fights. Uh, not just scheduled, but you've you know you've been in them before. It's been about six years since your last one. But Charles, he's never seen those championship rounds. Are you? Uh, if it gets to that point, you're not expecting it to. But if it gets to that point, who's got the edge? I'm not expecting it to. I don't want it to. But I'm fully fully prepared to. Truthfully, um, you know. I fought Benson Henderson for a second time, my last fight in Bellator, probably the most pressure I will ever feel in my entire life because I made the decision to leave Bellator and they say, okay, you're going to fight Benson Henderson. I think I'm better than Benson Henderson. I think I'm going to beat Benson Henderson. But Benson Henderson is a hard fight because he's he's unorthodox. He's durable. You never really look great against Benson Henderson, even if you beat him. So I settled in and told myself, hey, Michael, you're going to fight Benson Henderson for 25 minutes. And with that pace and with that mindset, I ended up knocking him out in the first round. So, or maybe it was the second round. I can't remember, but it was, it was early. Um, so with that same mindset, if I just, if I just put on a slow, steady pace, stay in his face, make him feel my presence, pick my shots. Um, I can fight 25 minutes all day long. I can redline for 25 minutes. I've proven that numerous times. He's never done that. Um, I'm not going to ever say that Charles Oliveira is a quitter like other people have, right? You know, he's he's shown that in the past. He's quit here and there. But Charles Oliveira is a seasoned veteran. He's a champion. He was a champion for, for years for a reason. He's got a heart of gold and a heart of a champion. So I'm excited to go out there and fight 25 minutes. I hope I don't. I hope I don't have to fight him for 25 minutes. I hope I get my hand raised within the first couple of rounds. But I'm prepared for it. And uh, I don't know if he is. Last question I have for you, and this is this is you know not about someone you're fighting now, obviously, but Armand Sarukian. He seems to be in your orbit like all the time. He basically has nothing but terrible things to say about you. He's he's a little bit of a hater for you, um, critical at just about every point. Latest thing, he's calling you easy money for Oliveira. What what's the deal with you two? Is there is there something between you two? Like how do you what do you think of him? No, there's not. You know, he's just a young young hungry a young hungry dude. Um, making his, making his presence be known, you know, and he's, he's, he's matured. He's got some great wins. His last win was over Oliveira, my next opponent. Um, so he's earned this title shot. He's, this is going to be a rematch with him and Islam. He's doing his thing, but yeah, he doesn't like me, says bad things about me. Um, you know, after he beat Oliveira, I was actually in back. I went back and congratulated him. I mean, it's one of those things, man, where I don't hold any animosity toward anybody. You know, I've had my, my spats with Poirier. I've had my spats with these different guys in the past, man. I, I enjoy, competing against people whether they like me or don't like me i'm going to always operate like i don't necessarily like the guy my opponent but i don't have anything against him i don't go into the octagon with any malice or ill will in my heart that's where i perform the best like i said a happy fighter is a dangerous fighter and that's that's my own personal um i guess anecdote of of my career thus far um but armin's doing his thing man i uh i wish him well i think islam absolutely smokes him um but at least he's got uh great hair